Scripture passage this morning comes from Matthew uh, chapter 2. Judy has already alluded to this in her children's sermon this morning. This is the story of the epiphany. It's the story of the journey of the wise men following the star all the way to Bethlehem uh, to behold uh, uh, the child Jesus. I'll be reading Matthew 2 verses 1 through 12 and I want to invite you to listen for the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Holy God, as we enter into this new year, let us behold the new thing that you are doing in Jesus Christ. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto your sight, O you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So here we are, the first Sunday of the new year. 2015 is now in the rearview mirror, and 2016 is what is on the horizon ahead. There's a song that we sing around this time of year that is really the Scottish poet Bobby Burns' musical gift to the world. It's a song that, for those of you who stayed up long enough on New Year's Eve, perhaps you sang it yourselves. I can promise you I was not awake at midnight on New Year's Eve, but maybe some of you were. And if you were, the song that you either sang or that you heard on television as they dropped that ball in Times Square was this. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and old lang syne? For Auld Lang Syne, my dear, for Auld Lang Syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for Auld Lang Syne. Now, when I say that, do you hear, do you hear the melody in your head? It, it's almost as familiar to us as Happy Birthday to You. Not quite as well known, not quite as universal, but it's close to it, right? As a matter of fact, why don't we give it a shot? Um, I didn't warn you of this ahead of time. I'm not going to throw the words up on the screen, but I think that you know it. So I want you to sing along with me, okay? Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and old lang syne? And now the chorus. For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll share a cup of kindness yet for old lang syne. Pretty good, by the way. Now, for a, for a song the title of which is an archaic Scottish phrase that we're not even sure what it means. That's a pretty well-known song in the English language, isn't it? 
You might be interested to know that not only is it well known in the English language, but this is one of the most translated songs into other languages around the world. And in that sense, it is very much like Happy Birthday to You. Uh, this song is sung in the native tongues of people from France all the way over to South Korea. In some countries, like Thailand, the song has been changed to fit the culture of the country so much that it's very much viewed as a song of that country. In fact, there are many Thai people who are not even aware that the song that they think of as almost like a, a Thai national anthem is actually a Scottish national anthem. And in the country of Japan, this is the default song that department stores play at closing time as a way to politely ask people to get out the door and go home. And that's really what that song's about, isn't it? It's about home. Auld Lang Syne is a song that points backwards. It's a song that points to the things of the past. It's a song that makes us think about cherished memories and dear friends. It's a song that makes us want to wax nostalgic for all those things about our lives that we don't want to let go of, even though we know we have to as we move into each new year. Well, this is an interesting time of the year in the sense that this is one of those times where a secular holiday and a sacred holiday match up with one another. The one that we are probably most familiar with is in, in May when the, the holiday of the Pentecost almost always uh, falls right around the time of Memorial Day. And when that happens, it's always tough for preachers to try to get people to focus on the sacred holiday, like Pentecost, as opposed to the secular holiday, which is what we think of when we're you know, getting days off work and going to the lake and whatnot, at least, at least right there in, in May. Well, here at this time of the year, that kind of secular, sacred tension is divided between the secular holiday of New Year's, of course, and the sacred holiday of Epiphany the day that we're celebrating, even though Judy pointed out, it's not technically until Wednesday, this is Epiphany Sunday, so this is the day that we observe it. It's the day in the life of the church, the day of worship that is closest to the holiday of Epiphany. What is Epiphany about? Well, Epiphany is about something that's actually very much that's different than Auld Lang Syne. If Auld Lang Syne at the, the strike of midnight on, on the 1st of January is something that kind of forces us to step reluctantly into the new year, thinking back on all the things that we have to leave behind, thinking back on all those cherished memories that are now in the rearview mirror, Epiphany is just the opposite of that. Epiphany is about something that is entirely new. Indeed, Epiphany is about something new that God is doing in the world, and that's what our scripture passage is about this morning. The scripture passage tells us that around the time that Jesus was born, there were certain wise men in the East. The word in the New Testament is magoi. We usually render that magi, and that is the root of our modern word magician. But these magoi, these magi, these magicians, were not magicians in the way that we think of magicians. They weren't up on a stage ready to saw a woman in half or, or pull a rabbit out of a hat. Rather, they were magi in the sense of being astronomers, or we would even think of them as astrologers. They were people who searched the heavens, they searched the starry sky looking for meaning in what they found above. And so they would pay attention to things like meteorites, and they would pay attention to comets, and they would pay attention to new stars that made their appearance. It's a new star, according to the Gospel of Matthew, that the Magi were paying attention to when they interpreted this sign as something that, that was that there was going to be a new king to the west of them. And so they gathered together with their things, they, their camels and their servants, and yes, their kingly gifts, their gifts fit for a king. And they traveled from the east to the west until they found the place that the star was pointing. But the interesting thing about that was, at least in the beginning, the star is not too specific. 
the star seems to be resting over the land of Judah, over Israel. But nothing more specific than that. And so what do the Magi do? Well, they do what you, you would think of them doing, kind of, let's say there was a star that was resting over the United States. If you wanted to ask the authorities where this new leader was going to kind of emerge, you would probably go to the place where the leaders reside, to the capital, to Washington, D.C., right? So these magi go to Jerusalem, and they begin asking the dignitaries there in Jerusalem, government officials, we've seen this star arise in the east, and we take it as a sign that a new king is to arise over this land. Have you seen him? And the dignitaries, of course, well, they go to the king, whose name is Herod. And they explained what these guys have come into town talking about. And, and Herod hears all of this, and he doesn't hear it as good news. In fact, Herod hears it as downright rebellion. Because what the Magi have said is that the star only emerged recently, and, well, Herod's been on the throne for 40 years. Herod is very much addicted to the ways of old Lang Syne. He likes things how they've been in the rearview mirror, and he would like for them to remain that way on the horizon ahead. What God is doing through these wise men is that God is saying that something new is going to be happening, something unprecedented, something that is very much counter to the ways of old Lang Syne. And so Herod devises a plan. He says, I tell you what. Let me call some of my scribes together, some of my scholars, and, and we'll find out where this new king is supposed to be. And they come forward, and, and what do the scribes and the scholars turn up? But out of Bethlehem, I will raise up someone to shepherd my people. And Herod pulls the wise men aside, and he says, Okay, fellas, okay, fellas, I tell you what. You go on to Bethlehem, and you tell me who you find, and you come back because... I'd like to carry my, old, my own gold, frankincense, and myrrh to pay homage to him. The wise men set off. They look ahead, and sure enough, there's the star again, this time pointing somewhere much more specific to the village of Bethlehem itself. They go there, and what they find is not a Herod arrayed in all of his finery or a palace for him to live in, but they find a humble dwelling where there's a child living with his mother and father who are at a station not much above that of peasants. And it's here that the star is shedding its holy light. Now the wise men walk up and surely at this point they must have thought to themselves, oh my, this is a new thing. And when they walk into that place and they look, I wouldn't be surprised if one of them sidled up to Joseph and looked down at that child and had a conversation kind of the way that Lucy and Susan had with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Do you remember that? When Peter and Edmund, Lucy and Susan had gone into Narnia searching after Aslan the lion, the one who was coming into the world to do a new thing, the one who was coming to do away with eternal winter and bring spring back into the land. They're sitting around the table at the beaver's home, and Lucy and Susan are trying to find out about this creature Aslan that the beavers are so excited to talk about. And Susan says, oh my, is he safe? I imagine I'd be a little intimidated to meet a lion. And Mr. Mr. Beaver said, Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So I imagine one of those wise men sidled up to Joseph and said, Oh my, he's a king? Is he even safe? And Joseph probably sat back and thought about all the angels that had been running around for the previous few months, talking about who this kid would turn out to be and preparing everyone from him to Mary to Elizabeth and Zechariah for it. And I imagine he probably said something along the lines of, no, I don't think he's going to be safe. 
but he's good. He's to be the king, I tell you. And at that point, the wise men knelt down and they laid out treasures at the foot of that child. Treasures fit for a king of gold, of frankincense, and of myrrh. And when they knelt down at that moment, they began something that was absolutely unprecedented in the world. Because you see, up to that point, the Jews had always thought of the Messiah as a people who were coming to redeem them. And what God was telling them and the world at that moment was that the Messiah had come not just to be the Savior of Israel, but to be the Savior of all. On the night that Jesus was born, the angels went first to Jews, shepherds out on the hillside, calling them to come in and worship the newborn king. But not long after that, he raised a star in the east as a way to call not Jews to the foot of the Christ child, but Gentiles, people like you and me, people who were not part of the covenant, not part of God's people. And when those wise men knelt down on that night, and when they laid their gifts out, they began to fulfill the words that would be spoken later by the, by the Apostle Paul, that there will come a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As you move into this new year, there's going to be a big tendency to look in the rearview mirror. We all have that desire to sing or to hum the words of Auld Lang Syne in some way over and over again to fiercely hold on to the things of the past, to wax nostalgic, almost to the point of being sappy and sentimental, not wanting to let go of that which is behind us. But the scripture tells us this morning that God is here to do a new thing. And if you can accept his grace to lay down your gold and your frankincense and your myrrh, to cast your crowns at his feet, then that which he will give you is greater than anything you could have ever known otherwise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.